A Treatise of Human Nature by David Hume. Book One of the Understanding. Part Two of the Ideas of Space and Time. Section Three of the Other Qualities of Our Ideas of Space and Time. No discovery could have been made more happily for deciding all controversies concerning ideas than that above mentioned, that impressions always take the precedency of them, and that every idea with which the imagination is furnished first makes its appearance in a correspondent impression. These latter perceptions are also clear and evident that they admit of no controversy, though many of our ideas are so obscure that tis almost impossible even for the mind which forms them to tell exactly their nature and composition. Let us apply this principle in order to discover farther the nature of our ideas of space and time. Upon opening my eyes and turning them to the surrounding objects, I perceive many visible bodies, and upon shutting them again, and considering the distance betwixt these bodies, I acquire the idea of extension, as every idea is derived from some impression which is exactly similar to it. The impressions similar to this idea of extension must either be some sensations derived from the sight, or some internal impressions arising from these sensations. Our internal impressions are our passions, emotions, desires, and aversions, none of which I believe will ever be asserted to be the model from which the idea of space is derived. There remains, therefore, nothing but the senses which can convey to us this original impression. Now, what impression do our senses here convey to us? This is the principal question, and decides without appeal concerning the nature of the idea. The table before me is alone sufficient by its view to give me the idea of extension. This idea then is borrowed from and represents some impression which this moment appears to the senses. But my senses convey to me only the impressions of colored points disposed in a certain manner. If the eye is sensible in anything farther, I desire it may be pointed out to me. But if it be impossible to show anything farther, we may conclude with certainty that the idea of extension is nothing but a copy of these colored points, and of the manner of their appearance. Suppose that in the extended object or composition of colored points, from which we first received the idea of extension, the points were of a purple color. It follows that, in every repetition of that idea, we would not only place the points in the same order with respect to each other, but also bestow on them that precise color with which alone we are acquainted. But afterwards, having experience of the other colors of violet, green, red, white, black, and of all the different compositions of these, and finding a resemblance in the disposition of colored points of which they are composed, we omit the peculiarities of color as far as possible, and found an abstract idea merely on that disposition of points or manner of appearance in which they agree, nay, even when the resemblance is carried beyond the objects of one sense, and the impressions of touch are found to be similar to those of sight in the disposition of their parts. This does not hinder the abstract idea from representing both upon account of the resemblance. All abstract ideas are really nothing but particular ones, considered in a certain light, but being annexed to general terms they are able to represent a vast variety and to comprehend objects which, as they are alike in some particulars, are in others vastly wide of each other. The idea of time being derived from the succession of our perceptions of every kind, ideas as well as impressions, and impressions of reflection as well as of sensation, will afford us an instance of an abstract idea which comprehends a still greater variety than that of space and yet is represented in the fancy by some particular individual idea of a determinate quantity and quality. And tis from the disposition of visible and tangible objects we receive the idea of space. So from the succession of ideas and impressions we form the idea of time, nor is it possible for time alone ever to make its appearance or be taken notice of by the mind. A man in a sound sleep or strongly occupied with one thought is insensible 
of time, and according as his perceptions succeed each other with greater or less rapidity, the same duration appears longer or shorter to his imagination. It has been remarked by a great philosopher that our perceptions have certain bounds in this particular, which are fixed by the original nature and constitution of the mind, and beyond which no influence of external objects on the senses is ever able to hasten or retard our thought. If you wheel about a burning coal with rapidity, it will present to the senses an image of a circle of fire, nor will there seem to be any interval of time betwixt its revolutions, merely because it is impossible for our perceptions to succeed each other with the same rapidity that motion may be communicated to external objects. Wherever we have no successive perceptions, we have no notion of time, even though there be a real succession in the objects. From these phenomena, as well as from many others, we may conclude that time cannot make its appearance to the mind, either alone or attended with a steady, unchangeable object, but is always discovered by some perceivable succession of changeable objects. To confirm this, we may add the following argument, which to me seems perfectly decisive and convincing. Tis evident that time or duration consists of different parts, for otherwise we could not conceive a longer or shorter duration it is also evident that these parts are not coexistent, for that quality of the coexistence of parts belongs to extension, and is what distinguishes it from duration. Now, as time is composed of parts that are not coexistent, an unchangeable object, since it produces none but coexistent impressions, produces none that can give us the idea of time, and consequently that idea must be derived from a succession of changeable objects and time in its first appearance can never be severed from such a succession. Having therefore found that time in its first appearance to the mind is always conjoined with a succession of changeable objects, and that otherwise it can never fall under our notice, we must now examine whether it can be conceived without our conceiving any succession of objects, and whether it can alone form a distinct idea in the imagination. In order to know whether any objects which are joined in impression be separable in idea, we need only consider if they be different from each other, in which case it is plain they may be conceived apart. Everything that is different is distinguishable, and everything that is distinguishable may be separated, according to the maxims above explained. If, on the contrary, they be not different, they are not distinguishable, and if they be not distinguishable, they cannot be separated. But this is precisely the case with respect to time. Compared with our successive perceptions, the idea of time is not derived from a particular impression mixed up with others, and plainly distinguishable from them, but arises altogether from the manner in which impressions appear to the mind, without making one of the number. Five notes played on a flute gives us the impression and idea of time, though time be not a sixth impression which presents itself to the hearing or any other of the senses, nor is it a sixth impression which the mind by reflection finds in itself. These five sounds making their appearance in this particular manner excite no emotion in the mind, nor produce an affection of any kind, which being observed by it can give rise to a new idea, for that is necessary to produce a new idea of reflection nor can the mind, by revolving over a thousand times all its ideas of sensation, ever extract from them any new original idea, unless nature has so framed its faculties that it feels some new original impression arise from such a contemplation. But here it only takes notice of the manner in which the different sounds make their appearance, and that it may afterwards consider without considering these particular sounds but may conjoin it with any other objects. The ideas of some objects it certainly must have, nor is it possible for it without these ideas ever to arrive at any conception of time, which, since it appears not as a primary distinct impression, can plainly be nothing but different ideas, or impressions, or objects disposed in a certain manner, 
that is, exceeding each other. I know there are some who pretend that the idea of duration is applicable in a proper sense to objects, which are perfectly unchangeable, and this I take to be the common opinion of philosophers as well as of the vulgar. But to be convinced of its falsehood, we need but reflect on the foregoing conclusion that the idea of duration is always derived from a succession of changeable objects, and can never be conveyed to the mind by anything steadfast and unchangeable. For it inevitably follows from thence that since the idea of duration cannot be derived from such an object, it can never, in any propriety or exactness, be applied to it, nor can anything unchangeable be ever said to have duration. Ideas always represent the objects of impressions from which they are derived and can never without a fiction represent or be applied to any other. By what fiction we apply the idea of time, even to what is unchangeable, and suppose, as is common, the duration is a measure of rest, as well as of motion, we shall consider afterwards. There is another very decisive argument which establishes the present doctrine concerning our ideas of space and time, and is founded only on that simple principle that our ideas of them are compounded of parts which are indivisible. This argument may be worth examining. Every idea that is distinguishable being also separable, let us take one of those simple indivisible ideas of which the compound one of extension is formed and separating it from all others, and considering it a part. Let us form a judgment of its nature and qualities. Tis plain it is not the idea of extension, for the idea of extension consists of parts, and this idea, according to the supposition, is perfectly simple and indivisible. Is it therefore nothing? That is absolutely impossible, for as the compound idea of extension, which is real, is composed of such ideas. Were these so many non-entities, there would be a real existence composed of non-entities, which is absurd. Here, therefore, I must ask, what is our idea of a simple and indivisible point? No wonder if my answer appears somewhat new, since the question itself has scarce ever yet been thought of. We are wont to dispute concerning the nature of mathematical points, but seldom concerning the nature of their ideas. The idea of space is conveyed to the mind by two senses, the sight and touch, nor does anything ever appear extended, that is not either visible or tangible. That compound impression, which represents extension, consists of several lesser impressions that are indivisible to the eye or feeling, and may be called impressions of atoms or corpuscles endowed with color and solidity. But this is not all. Tis not only requisite that these atoms should be colored or tangible in order to discover themselves to our senses, tis also necessary we should preserve the idea of their color or tangibility in order to comprehend them by our imagination. There is nothing but the idea of their color or tangibility which can render them conceivable by the mind. Upon the removal of the ideas of these sensible qualities, they are utterly annihilated to the thought or imagination. Now, such as the parts are, such is the whole. If a point be not considered as colored or tangible, it can convey to us no idea, and consequently the idea of extension, which is composed of the ideas of these points, can never possibly exist. But if the idea of extension really can exist, as we are conscious it does, its parts must also exist, and in order to that must be considered as colored or tangible. We have therefore no idea of space or extension, but when we regard it as an object either of our sight or feeling. The same reasoning will prove that the indivisible moments of time must be filled with some real object or existence, whose succession forms the duration and makes it be conceivable by the mind.